Hello, I'm Gian Andrea Rossati with the University of Cincinnati. Today I'm going to present uh, a study on the flexural strength of eye beams with holes in the tension flange. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors Ryan Carson, our former graduate student, and my colleagues Tom Burns and James Watson at the University of Cincinnati. First of all, let's go through a quick history of net section considerations here. At the infancy of uh, the structural steel industry, rolling was uh, not very well developed and only small sections could be rolled. And as a consequence, to obtain large members, the only option was to build them up using angles and plates and using rivets to connect them together. Um, as a consequence of that, and for the presence of a large number of holes uh, along the length of uh, members, the use of net section properties had been formalized as early as 1891. Even the AISC uh, specification in its first edition in 1923, by the way, that was nine pages long as opposed to uh, current size specifications, section 12 in that document was focused on the calculation of uh, net section properties for uh, design purposes. As manufacturing technology progressed, uh, the use of rivets declined in favor of high strength bolts and the industry was able to uh, roll larger and larger sections uh, to make them available for designers. So the issue of net section capacity, however, remained relevant, uh, especially in the case of splices and in the case of beam column connections. And in both situations, flexural net section capacity is the consideration that is chief in that case. So the case of beam column connections is a really good example of this. This uh, beam to column connection is taken from AISC 358 that contains the pre-qualified connections for use in special and intermediate moment frames for seismic applications. This is a bolted flange plate connection and in this case the plastic hinge in the beam is expected to take place close to the last row of bolts that we had there. So there will certainly be considerations uh, for the presence of those holes in the flanges of the beam. Um, even more interestingly, the uh, double T connection that is uh, shown here at the bottom of the slide is also from AISC 358, but the difference here is that its design procedure uh, in that standard actually incorporates considerations that include uh, the net section uh, of the flanges and how to calculate and account for the presence of the holes in there. This is the only example in American practice where this is actually explicitly taken into account, but unfortunately it's just limited to special intermediate moment frames for seismic application. All standard buildings in non-seismic areas uh, are still subject just to the current NSC specification that, as we will see, are a bit on the conservative side. So, despite the importance of this issue, a surprisingly small body of research has been performed on these topics, and so we will discuss everything that's available at this point in time. In the AISC specification, uh, the first instance of the appearance of provisions against tension flange fracture appeared in 1989. Um, they were updated in the 2005 edition, and to date they remain substantially unchanged. Uh, these provisions consist in, first, a tensile capacity check to make sure that the flange is not going to undergo a net section fracture before it can develop its full uh, gross section yielding strength. Should this check not be uh, met, meaning that the uh, flange would actually tend to break in a net section fracture under uniform distributed stress, then the nominal uh, moment capacity for uh, that beam is calculated at a heavy penalty using the elastic section modules for the gross cross-section. There is also a ratio of the, um, of the net section uh, area versus the gross area of the, uh, of the flanges, which further decreases uh, the amount of available uh, nominal moment in the cross-section. Uh, Dexter and Alstad in 2004 uh, and, and to follow that, Swanson in 2016 highlighted the high level of conservatism of the AIC expressions. In particular, Dexter and Alstad concluded that net to gross section ratio is really not a good parameter to predict tensile flange fracture. And also they showed that flexural member could reach the full plastic moment even with a net to gross ratio as low as 0.70. They proposed the following expression to evaluate the uh, net uh, capacity uh, in flexure of a beam. Uh, this would be basically the ultimate strength of the material multiplied by a net section, plastic section modules. Uh, basically, the plastic section modules calculated over the net cross section. And this was kept by the plastic moment of the beam using the gross section 
um, plastic modules. In 2016, Swanson collected all the existing experimental data on flexural capacity of beams, 18 data points total. He made a comparison to ISC 360 2016, and this comparison showed an average 22% overestimate uh, of the provisions uh, with respect to the experimental data, with values of uh, overestimation as large as 40%. So that's where we come in. Our goal was to uh, expand the excellent experimental data and the methodology that we decided to use was to use abacus explicit using material and geometric nonlinearity and uh, including damage initiation and to a less extent damage evolution. Uh, we modeled simply supported I-shaped beams subject to a uniform moment that were continuously placed on the top range to prevent lateral torsion on buckling. We modeled 10 I-shapes from ranging from W2016 by 31 to W36 by 150. These shapes were chosen to correspond to some of the existing data points and to be the most efficient shapes for plastic hinging in order to put the highest demand on the uh, net sections of these beams. Five rows of two bolts were provided at mid-span of both flanges using standard hole sizes for bolts ranging from half an inch bolt to an inch and a half using both hole sizes from the 2010 and the 2016 specification. The difference there is that the whole size for a one inch bolt changed between the two editions. The material used was an actual A992 material that was measured as part of a different project. And overall, 123 models were created. Um, all 18 tests in literature were modeled as part of the validation process. The main differences between the model and the actual experiments was that there was some uncertainty in the actual material characteristics. We used A992 for all because although not all of the experiments had A992 material, but they did not report the actual measure stress strain characteristics for the material they used. So instead of having to guess, we preferred going for the same material for all. Our models were perfect as opposed to the real um, structures. So we ignored imperfections and residual stresses. And also uh, our model had potentially a different internal force distribution. We had constant moment. Some of the testing literature actually were beam column convection tests, so they had constant shear and linearly variable moment along their lines. Even with these differences, overall, the results of the models turned out to be 10.5% on the conservative side with a 4.9% standard deviation, which we uh, deem to be quite acceptable for our purposes. Even when accounting for this average 10.5% conservativeness, a comparison with the ISC equation uh, shows that we have about a 45.5% difference in the predicted values uh, for AISC and those uh, from the model that we have there. The slopes are also nearly parallel, showing that there isn't any special size or any special ratio that causes this difference. This difference remains constant uh, for the entire um, range of the uh, test that we, that we consider. In 2016, as part of the study, Swanson proposed two equations uh, using a best fit approach for the experimental data. The two equations are shown here and they are compared against the results of the model. In both cases, you can see that we are obtaining uh, really good results. The R squared for both cases is well above 0.98. The error is just above 1%, and so is the standard deviation. So none, none of the equations is particularly better than the other. Both of them work very well. As part of these projects, however, we decided to try to develop uh, equations in the attempt of moving away from the best fit approach and going toward a more uh, uh, stronger tie to the physics of the uh, of the stress distributions, tying things to the cross-sectional properties. The first two equations we developed were very similar to each other. Uh, they have the flange contributions that are the same as the um, as the AISC equation, only with the elastic modules uh, considered here. And th for the web contribution, which is discounted in the AISC contribution, we have in the first case the ultimate strength. Uh, in a plastic distribution over the height of the web. And in the second case, we have a plastic distribution over the height of the web using the plastic modules uh, of the web multiplied by uh, the yielding strength of the material. This is the comparison of both equations to the uh, FEA model. Uh, you can easily see that equation six is overestimating quite constantly uh, the prediction of the model, while equation seven is underestimating it. But both of them are actually fairly close to it. 
In an attempt of, to simplify things, we actually try to use something very simple, uh, an elastic distribution over the net cross-section over the entire beam, reaching the ultimate strength. In this case, however, the result wasn't so good, and although some results were fitting quite well on uh, the uh, moment, uh, on the um, finite element uh, prediction of the moment, the others were quite far away. So we discarded this equation. We came up to equation 9 and 10. Again, these are similar. They, they uh, include the contribution of the flanges using the ultimate strength with a plastic distribution over the net section of the flanges and the contribution of the web. Equation 9 uses an elastic distribution along the height of the web, reaching the ultimate strength. And equation 10 uses a plastic distribution over the height of the web using the yielding strength. As a result, both of them, the square and the triangle, really are very close to each other, and they predict reasonably well uh, the uh, results of the model, um, better so in cases where the ZX net has small values, as the ZX net values uh, increase, the prediction is not so good. Finally, we came to equation 11, which for all intents and purposes is the same as the one by Dexter and Alstad 2004, and in this case, uh, the prediction is actually quite good. And again, uh, it's better for smaller values of ZX net, and as the values uh, increase, the prediction actually degrades a little bit. It's worth, however, to look into this prediction a little further. Um, notice that, if you recall, the FEA model overestimated the experimental data points by about 10%. So we asked ourselves, what would happen if we took 90% of the values of the FEA moment of fracture and compared against equation 11? Well, what happens is that we get a really good fit with an average error of 2.7% and a standard deviation, deviation of 2%. So in conclusion, um, we can certainly say that the IAC equations are conservative by more than 40%, as has been shown in literature. The equation that was proposed by Dexter and Alstad in 2004 is by far the most accurate in the prediction of the moment at fracture initiation. Using a resistance factor of 0.9 would actually render all predictions conservative, but not overly so. For the future, we're planning on building a model including imperfection and residual stresses, and also accounting for the various uh, steel grades, so that we could actually get even closer predictions of experimental tests. But obviously, there's no substitute for actual experimental tests. This being said, I thank you very much for your kind attention and await any questions that might come up. Thank you.